taken us through. We give you praise for your gospel. Just take a minute right now where you're sitting to thank Jesus for the gospel message. That includes all these things that we're to praise him for. Praise him that he created the universe. Praise him that he created man and he created you with a plan and with a purpose. Praise him that though man fell, he provided us with a redeemer. Praise him that he has an eternal plan for all of us. And that he has given us victory over our spiritual enemy. Praise him that he has called you and I to spread the gospel message. In Jesus' name. Everybody said amen. amen. Okay, so this is it. This is where the rubber meets the road. For a lot of ministries, this is what defines them. This is evangelism. Okay, the final component of the gospel message that Jesus exhorted his apostles to do is, now go make disciples. Now go preach the gospel. I want you to take everything that you have seen. I want you to take everything that you have learned from me. I want you to take the power you take from me, the authority you take from me. But more than that, the love that I have shown you, the grace that I have shown you, and the mercy that I have shown you, and witness of that to everybody around you. As Christians, there should not be anybody who comes into contact with us regularly that does not feel and hear those things, that does not hear the gospel message, does not feel the love of God, does not see evidence of the mercy and the grace of God in the way we treat them, in the way we talk, and in everything we do. This is part of the gospel message. And here, today, we're studying... Uh, in essence, what evangelism is, taking that gospel message and sharing it. This is the key. This is the key to existence. This is the key to life. That's why everybody tries to establish and find out, is there something after death? After, because everybody fears it, everybody lives in constant dread of it, it looms and it hangs over just about everybody that day, that moment when your life here on earth ends, and this is a common thing that ties every single human being together. We alone on this planet are the only creatures that understand mortality. I've heard psychologists and, and psychiatrists trying to, trying to tell me or, or, or show me that dolphins understand it too or monkeys understand it too. I think that's a bunch of hooey. But people live under constant dread of this moment when their life will end. And it is what defines your life. If you are a confirmed atheist, and you do not believe there is any spiritual component to human existence at all, then your life at the end of the day has no purpose. It doesn't, it, 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 there's no point to morality. There's no point to defining good or bad. You would basically be a creature of simply satisfying and gratifying whatever carnal desires you had at the moment, there should be absolutely no morality involved at all. Who cares if somebody else suffers because you get what you want? Because they're not going to remember, and you're not going to remember, and it's all going to be forgotten anyway. Regardless of what you try to do, there are precious few people on earth that are remembered uh, for what they have done. And even if they are remembered, so what? If you're an atheist, they don't know that they're remembered. They don't know that they're being honored. To an atheist, it doesn't matter if you honor Buddha, it doesn't matter if you honor Jesus or Moses, it doesn't matter if you honor Martin Luther King or JFK, because they have no idea they're being honored. They're dead and they're gone. And for us as believers, our take on life and our take on existence is completely different. Take a look at Job chapter 14. It's one of my favorite passages because it's, it, it contains so much. Now, I have purposely shared the New Living Translation uh, 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 with you this morning in your study sheet because it makes it easier to convey these ideas to people who are pre-Christian and they don't believe yet and they are not familiar with the way the Bible works. Even if you use the King James but you stand there and explain every single word, then the process of salvation becomes very ponderous and it becomes very difficult and what I've observed in recent times is when that, is, that is, becomes necessary because of the translation somebody uses, they develop this very elitist mentality where, and you can't understand this unless I'm here explaining it to you, 
which fills the person who's listening with a sense of hopelessness and misdirection. So <clears throat> to me, I like using the New Living Translation, especially for new believers. I'm looking at a new translation, by the way, uh, the modern English version, MEV. I don't know if you've heard about it before. So far, I'm not totally sold. I like the NIV, the 1984 version, better. What's that? Oh, that's weird, yeah? Anyway, but anyway, that's why I like the New Living Translation. So let's take a look at it. And in, ver in chapter 14, starting with verse 14, which I find interesting, that's four sevens, can the dead live again? That's the essential question. Is there life after death? Can the dead live again? If so, says Job, this would give me hope through all my years of struggle, and I would eagerly, eagerly await the release of death. This transforms the nature of human existence. If you truly believe that there is life after death, and, and it's a good life, then you don't dread death, you don't dread the termination of life, and you wouldn't see it that way. When I, I think about my parents being gone, when I think about my brother being gone, when I think about so many people, now I'm 57 years old, so I'm getting to that stage where I have almost equal in my major relationships in my life on that side and on this side. And I realize 10 years from now, the majority of people that have had a major impact on my life are all going to be on the other side. This changes the way I see things. This changes and transforms the way anybody sees things. I would eagerly await the release of death. You would call and I would answer. This is Job talking to God. And you would yearn for me, your handiwork. This changes the way he sees God. Even if there is a spiritual supreme being, if there is no life after death, what is the point? That shows that that supreme being is a giant kid and we are ants, and he's got a magnifying glass, and he's just playing with us. But if there is life after death, according to Job, this shows him that there's, this God is a loving God. And that obviously this God cares about him, and he wants to care about the God. See, all of this is what defines our, our, our relationship and our parameters of understanding as it regards God. For then you would guard my steps instead of watching for my sins. My sins would be sealed in a pouch and you would cover my guilt. You would watch out for me. You would make sure that uh, everything that happens to me in this life, look at the faith that Job has. Everything that happens in this life is to prepare me for the next life. If I'm going to live forever in an eternal life, then technically if you really love me, God, is what he's saying, you're not going to give a rip so much about what I'm going through here but you're going to prepare me for this eternal life which is going to last immeasurably longer and is going to be mine forever. So this is the key question. Is there resurrection after death? And if so, how does that change and transform how we live and how we feel about God and ourselves and other people around us? In John chapter 11, verse 25, Jesus addresses this problem head on. And he tells Martha, who he is talking to, about the death of her uh, uh, bro uh, brother Lazarus. And this is important because to understand the context of this passage, you have to know he is talking about physical death, and she is missing her brother who is sealed in a tomb for four days now. His body is beginning to decay and smell. And death is a very real topic. Physical death is a very real topic here. So this is exactly what Jesus is addressing. And he says, I am the resurrection and the life. Anyone who believes in me will live even after dying. Though a man dies, yet shall he live. These words transform and define forever who Jesus is and what he is. This gives him the power and the authority that should take anybody's breath away. I am the resurrection and the life. You are walking with the resurrection and the life. 
You are talking with the resurrection and life. I'm the one who defined resurrection. I'm the one who defined life. I'm the one who created you. I'm the one who knows what you are going to be doing 10,000 years from now. I am the resurrection and the life. And whosoever believes in me, even though he physically dies, yet he will live. Now, here's what we have found as we study scripture is the truth. And the truth of the matter is how God defines death and life is different than you and I and our definition of death and life. We think of life as existence and we think of death as non-existence. That is not the way God sees life and death. Thanatos, he does not define that way. Thanatos is basically a separation because According to the Bible, everybody has eternal life. Every single person you know, whether they are Christian or not, actually is going to live forever. Is actually going to exist forever. The question answered by God and Jesus in this passage is, where? Because if they have no faith in Christ, where they are going to spend that eternal life is in a separated Thanatos place. If they believe in Jesus as Lord and Savior, then where they are going to spend that eternal existence is going to be inclusive with Him. Zoe is going to be with Him. Existence with God. Existence with Him. And that's what Jesus is talking about. When we talk about ministry application, generally speaking, evangelism is uh, which is related to the word euangelion, the good news, uh, is, is, is an application of salvation. Communicating the thoughts and principles that somebody needs in order to be saved. And when we say saved, we mean, again, there's eternal life for everybody, but where are they going to be? Are they going to be separated from God, i.e. separated from us? Or is there going to be inclusion? Is there going to be eternal life? Everyone who believes in me, everyone, somebody say everyone, everyone, believes in me will never, ever die. They will never stop living. They will never stop existing. That will never happen. Okay? So this is the message. And he tells you and I vicariously through the apostles in Mark chapter 16, go into all the world and preach, that is declare, the gospel. He says, preach the gospel. He doesn't say discuss it. He doesn't say sit there and debate with people. He doesn't say wrangle. He says, preach it. I want you to declare it. I want you to tell people. And if they like it, they like it. If they don't, they don't. If they listen, they listen. If they reject, reject. But your job is to preach the gospel. Your job is to declare the gospel. To make sure people around you know there is a God who loves you. He created this universe. He created you. There's an eternal future. He has a plan for you here, and He has a plan for you in eternity. And this final component, if you believe in Jesus as the Son of God, you will have this eternal life. That must be preached to everybody you know. If it's not, you are not doing what God has asked you to do. You are not showing Him love, because the way He wants to be loved, listen to me now carefully, this is inescapable in Scripture. If you want to claim you love God, you must love your brother. If you don't, Bible says, any man who says he loves God but hates his brother, that man is a liar, and the truth is not in him. You are fooling yourself. If you truly understand who God is, and you truly want to show him love, you must love those around him, around you. That's his criteria. That's his measurement. All the boo-hoo, ballyhoo, chicken masui, rasha mohandai with your hands up in the air and squalling to God in the early day, morning moments, but you don't love people and you don't love those around you and you don't show them care and love must be sincere is what the Bible says. If you don't have this, you're fooling yourself. God says, you don't, you don't really love me. It's like a wife and a husband who cheats on her. And then the husband kept, baby, I, I, I love you. You know I love you. I'm sorry, but to her, she understands you do not. You are defining love in a different way than I do. Okay, if you mean that as love, I reject that notion. I, I don't accept that. And God is going to be the same with you and I. If we claim we love him, but we do not love those around us. Can somebody say amen? 
Okay, so I'm going to take you through two passages. For me, salvation can be found in two passages, and they're very, very clear. They're very, very clear, especially in the New Living Translation. This is what we are supposed to preach, and everybody around us should know it. Let's start with Romans chapter 3. And both of these passages center around two key verses in Scripture. Romans 3.23 and Romans 10. Eight, nine. Okay? Those are the key central scriptures, but these passages that surround them, to me, contain the essence of what scripture is. You, only, you don't have to memorize the whole Bible, you just got to know these two parts. And I strongly recommend you read it to them right here out of a New Living Translation, because it's going to be easy to understand. Romans 3, starting with verse 20, says... For no one can ever be made right in God's sight by doing what his law commands. This is very important. Nobody can ever be made right doing what the Lord says. The, the concession right off the bat is, there is no point in you changing yourself. There is no point in you stopping smoking, stopping drugs, stopping this, stopping that. There is no point in that if you do not accept Jesus. Uh, years ago, the great pastor E.V. Hill... Uh, preach this message that I still remember to this day. He said, the purpose of the church and the purpose of Christianity is to save the lost at any cost. Save the lost at any cost. He said, I don't make apologies to anybody for what I do and what this church does if it gets people saved. You don't like the plays we put on. You don't like our music. You don't like our this. You don't like our that. I don't care because I'm trying to get people saved. This is a man with an evangelist heart. Does every single uh, church have to run like that? No. But he is an evangelist slash pastor. I am a teacher slash pastor. E.V. Hill is more like Wayne Cadero. He is an evangelist pastor, and his one goal is to get people saved. He doesn't care if they give up doing this or not. He doesn't care if they understand this or not. He doesn't care if they have deep understanding of these theological uh, points. If they're not saved, and if they're not leading the people around them to salvation, I don't give a rip how smart they are. I don't give a rip how mature they are. Now, on my side of it, the way God has raised me up, I believe that teaching people the Word of God and getting them to comprehend what the truths of the words uh, have is what enables them to be good preachers and enables them to minister to others and minister not only salvation but discipleship as well, which I think is very, very important, and so does God. That's why in Mark it says, Go ye therefore and make disciples of all nations. Okay? So, those are the two sides. Evangelism has to do with salvation. And this says, this is right, this is the first precept. Nobody can save themselves. There is no point in horking about holiness if somebody does not know Jesus. All you're going to wind up doing is getting somebody to quit smoking so they breathe easier in hell. Get somebody to give up their drinking. That's awesome. Then in hell they'll be sober. Get somebody to not go into a, 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 a fornicating or adulterous or homosexual relationship, that's great. Then they're, they're, they're going to be clean in hell. All of these things do not matter if the person's not saved. And no one can ever be made right in God's sight by doing what his law commands. So this right off the bat for the evangelist becomes a null point. For the more we know God's law, the clearer it becomes that we aren't obeying it. This is what Paul says. That's the purpose of the law. The purpose of the law is to make sure, not, not, not to get you into a, a status of life where don't do this, don't do this, don't do this, don't do this, do do this, do this, and do this, and do this. That's not the point. The point of the law is to show you how lost you are. It's like a, 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 a caddy. One time I golfed at Los Verdes Golf Course in Palos Verdes, California, and uh, they used to have caddies back then. So, uh, 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 me and my brother Steve, we, we, we got caddies, okay? And caddies, you know, they just follow you and they'll give you advice. If you ask for it, if you don't say anything, they'll just hand you a club. No, you really, seriously, you should hit this one. Um, you know, and it was a fun day. And at the end of the day, I shot an 87 and uh, Steve shot a 92. And our caddy said, no, you didn't. We did. I marked my thing down. Well... Actually, for the clubhouse, we have to mark it too. I shot a 112, and Steve shot a 127 or something like that. 
because every single time you touched this ball and you, you grounded your club in the sand and uh, you, you, you did this and you did that and you took a mulligan, which you're really not supposed to do, yada, 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 they added up a true score. My 87 was actually 112. Okay, God is like that. The purpose of the law is so that you come to understand how lousy you are. As he cited those rules to me, I realized how many rules I broke and what a lousy golfer I really was. And I was fooling myself thinking I was an 80s golfer. I wasn't. I was, I was having trouble breaking 100. And these guys pointed that out. In like manner, that's the purpose of the law. If you really understood what the Word of God said, you'd understand how lost you are. And there's no way, simply because now you're not drinking and getting drunk every night, that now, because you're not doing that, you're living a life good enough to walk into heaven. Not true. There is so much stuff you are not catching that it would be terrifying for you at the end of the day if an angel just appeared and said, actually, what did you do wrong today? Well, I lied to my sister and, and I swore at the person on the, uh, who cut me off and, 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 I, and I took too much cake tonight at the refrigerator. Did I kind of get it? Okay, you got three. I have 3,872 infractions that you committed in the last hour. Okay, that's kind of the way it is. So all these hoity-toity people who think they've really cracked the code and I don't do what these other guys do, you're missing the point. But verse 21 is where it comes to grips. But God, now God has shown us a different way of being right in His sight. A different way. Everybody say a different way. This is different. If you don't present the gospel message as different from this be good and you'll get into heaven, you are missing the point. Not by obeying the law, but by the way promised in scriptures long ago. This was always God's plan. He knew from the start man was not going to be able to pull off the law. He knew from the start that nobody in this room, nobody on this island, nobody in this nation, nobody on this planet who has ever lived would ever be able to accommodate his law and his standard of righteousness. He knew that. And for you to stand there and try to yorp with somebody about changing their life, you are missing the point when it comes to evangelism. That is not the issue. The issue is God loves you so much that he has provided you with a different way of going to heaven that does not include these things. Verse 22, we, have, we are made right in God's sight, read carefully now, when we trust in Jesus Christ to take away our sins. We are made right in God's sight when we trust in Jesus Christ to take away our sins. <clears throat> you don't take away sins by stop doing them. Because you're never going to stop. We are made right in God's sight the way He sees it, not the way man sees it. Now man, they're going to see it different. Man, we tend to be fault finders. We tend to be Pharisees. All we ever look for, like an oncologist, we just constantly look for the lump. What can I criticize? What can I cite? What can I correct? What can I say? What can I nail them on? Okay, that tends to be, it's very carnal. Uh, it's something that is not uh, a fruit of the Spirit. But nonetheless, it's, it, it, it tends to be human nature to do that. But here, the gospel of Jesus Christ is very different. We're made right in God's sight when we trust in Jesus Christ to take away our sins. And we can, we all can be saved. Somebody say all. In this same way, no matter who we are or what we have done. Now that is a profoundly powerful statement for people who think that they have sinned so much and piled up so much. I've seen people crack and cry. Jose, you share this with people who you're ministering to and show them it is in the Word of God and you watch people crumble to their knees to understand the principle that God has said. We all can be saved in this same way. Because I'm a murderer or a rapist, I don't have to do anything different than Yuka or Nancy or Sandra. I don't have to do anything different than them. Because to God, 
everybody can be saved the same way, no matter what we, who we are or what we've done. For all have sinned, and all fall short of God's glorious standards. Okay? This is the essence of the salvation that Jesus offers through faith in his name. Yet now God in his gracious kindness declares us not guilty, declares us not guilty, declares us not guilty. You may not hear it from a judge. You may not hear it from your wife. You may not hear it from your father. You may not hear it from your friend. You may not hear it from your brother. You may never be affirmed. Your father may never tell you he's proud of you. You may never cross the goal line, spike the ball, and, and make everybody happy with you. Because they will always consider you guilty of something and always try to cite you for something and always try to nail you for something. But look at what this says. Yet now God in His gracious kindness has declared us not guilty. You do this and God will declare you not guilty. When you stand before the Lord, He will hear not guilty. My brother, regardless of all his dumb mistakes, he's not guilty. My father, not guilty. Mother, not guilty. Ricky, not guilty. Your brother, not guilty. Your son, not guilty. Not guilty. That's the pronouncement. Because, verse 25, God sent Jesus to take the punishment for our sins. There is supposed to be punishment. He is not pleased with sin. And, by the way, this has nothing to do with salvation. If you want to show God you love Him and you want to be blessed by Him fully, you're going to stop sinning and repent turn around. But Jesus took the punishment for our sins and to satisfy God's anger against us. Now this is the other part, because people walk around life thinking, God is still mad at me, God is still mad at me. Yeah, he's forgiven me, but God is still mad at me. He is not still mad at you, because Jesus has satisfied not only punishment for your sin, he has also taken God's anger. So all the anger he feels towards you because of your failures and your mistakes and your problems, Jesus took upon himself on the cross, and he carried it for you there. This is the message. This is what we are supposed to be telling people. This is the good news. To some people, it's not good news, because they're bitter people, and they want to make people pay and pay and pay and pay and pay. Instead, Jesus hung on the cross, and he paid and paid and paid and paid. Until now, we are declared not guilty. And God's anger against us is satisfied. We are made right with God when we believe that Jesus shed his blood, sacrificing his life for us. Sounds familiar, doesn't it? Sounds like 1 Corinthians 15. I believe that you died for me on the cross. I believe that you shed your blood for me, that you poured your life out for me, and you paid the price. And now, because of what you have done, I am not going to be punished, and God is not angry with me anymore. This is part of the gospel message. This is part of what Jesus said, go into all the world and preach this. This is what we're supposed to be preaching. Now, God was being entirely fair and just when he did not punish those who sinned in former times, and he is entirely fair and just in this present time when he declares sinners to be right in his sight because they believe in Jesus. This is justice. This is God's justice. This is how he defines justice. I forgive who I want to forgive the way I want to forgive them. I don't care how many, how many penalties you think somebody should have to pay. I don't care how much you think they should be kneeling and groveling and wailing and crying. I don't give a rip what you think. I will forgive who I will forgive, and I will forgive them the way I want to forgive them. And the way I have declared people will be forgiven for their sins is when they believe in Jesus and that he shed his blood for them on the cross. That's what I, God, have decided is going to be the way. You want to apply it another way? That's fine, but you're misquoting me and you're misrepresenting me and I wish you'd stop. Verse 27, can we boast then? that we have done anything to be accepted by God. No. Because our acquittal is not based on our good deeds. Now look at me clearly. Okay, Somebody repents of their sins. Here's what they can say. I have shown God I loved him, love him by giving this up. 
I want to declare how much I love God and how much I, I, I care about God by worshiping Him, attending church and tithing. And I, I want to show Him. I want to give my life to Him. I want to turn everything I am over so that He knows how much I love Him. This is worship. This is what worship is. This is why I do those things. But none of that contributes to my salvation and my eternal life. None of that contributes to God saying that I am not guilty anymore and that I am not going to be punished ever for any of my sins because Jesus took it all and He carried it on the cross. Can we boast that we have done anything to be accepted of God? No. Because our acquittal is not based on our good deeds. It is based on our faith. So, we are made right with God through faith and not by obeying the law. This must be clearly understood if you are going to evangelize and represent God correctly. Should people repent of their sins? Absolutely. We just talked a couple Wednesdays ago about faith without works is dead. You really believe in Jesus and you really believe He has done what He has said He has done. You will love Him, you will worship Him, and your life will no longer be your own. But never fool yourself into thinking that this repentance and sanctification that you enter engender yourself to has anything to do with your salvation because it does not. Always refer back to this passage. Romans 10, 9 and 10. Let me conclude with that. I'm sorry I went over. If you confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord. Let me hear it. If you confess with your mouth Jesus is Lord. Let me hear it again. Turn to at least two people and tell them, Jesus is Lord. Jesus is Lord. Jesus is Lord. Make sure you tell. Look them in the eye. Don't just spread your arms out and go, ah, 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 ah. Just make sure somebody hears you. Okay? And believe in your heart God raised him from the dead. Raise your hand and say, I believe. I believe. You will be saved. You will be. You will be. You will be saved. For it is by believing in your heart that you are made right with God. And it's by confessing with your mouth that you're saved. As scripture tells us, anyone who believes in him will not be disappointed. That's the message. When it says, go preach the gospel, this is the core message when it comes to salvation. If you will take this one study sheet, copy it off as many times as you want, pass it to somebody, and walk them through it. It should only take you five, ten minutes, unless they have questions. Don't get caught up in theology but just answer them quickly and move on, you will lead a lot of people to the Lord. I don't know how many people I've led to the Lord. I tend to be a teacher more than an evangelist, but God has blessed me and I've done my share. But at the end of the day, this is the gospel message. This is what separates Christianity from every other religious system. This is what makes God different than what man would create him to be. Religion, at the end of the day, is an exercise where you do one thing that will make God do something else. That's the essence of what religion is. Christianity is a relationship with a God who has done it all for us, if we would but believe. That's a different thing. Amen? Okay, let's pray. Father, in Jesus' name, we thank you that you have sent us to go out into the world and preach the gospel. We ask you to temper our hearts right now with the love, the mercy, and the grace that your gospel reflects. Fill us with a love for people around us. Fill us with a passion for them that we might show them your love and grace and mercy. Anoint us with your power that not only would they understand these concepts, which is only half of it, but they would feel your embrace and they would be filled with the hope of their eternal life as we speak these words of hope and assurance and blessing. In Jesus' name we pray. Everybody said amen. amen. Thank you. Sorry I held you for longer, but that officially concludes our Gospel Truth series on Sunday mornings. Somebody give the Lord praise.